Good morning, friends, and welcome to this service of worship on this Lord's Day from St. Paul United Methodist Church in downtown Ocean Springs. Thank you for joining, of, uh, joining us for this time of worship. We'll begin our time of worship with uh, Maker in Whom We Live. Let us sing together. Maker in whom we live, in whom we are and who, the glory, power, and praise we Let all the ransomed race render in thanks their lives to thee for thy redeeming grace, the grace to sinners showed, ye heavenly choirs proclaim, and cry. Salvation to our God, salvation to the Lamb. Spirit of holiness, let all thy saints adore thy sacred energy and bless thine heart renewing power. Not angel tongues can tell Thy love's ecstatic height The glorious joy unspeakable The beatific sight Eternal triune God Let all the Join me as we affirm our faith together with the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. 
now come to that time when we prepare our hearts and minds to pray together as God's people. We want to hear from you for, about your concerns and joys. Please feel free to share those. Uh, email us or let us know what's going on in your life. As we worship together as the people of God, we hold one another up in prayer and pray for God's world as well. Let us pray. O oh Lord our God, you have created us in your image, and we are astounded at your goodness and your mercy and your forbearing spirit toward us. Most of all, your steadfast love that never fails. We praise you that above all, you are faithful. You've also created, created us with the ability to choose between life and death and between blessings and curses. We pray that you would help us to reject the advice of the wicked or sit with the scoffers, as the psalmist says, and by your grace empower us to put our trust in you. For truly blessed are those who trust in you, O God, whose trust is the Lord. We pray for those who put their trust in themselves instead of in you. We pray for those who put their trust in princes and politicians and find themselves deceived and misled. We pray for those who are poor and who hunger and who weep. We pray for those who are making poor choices in their lives. May they turn to you for guidance. For blessed are those who trust in you, O Lord. We pray in this season of winter for trees, for rivers and streams, for all your creation. Turn us from our exploitive ways to help you renew the earth. Oh God, sometimes it seems that you demand much, but promise that your yoke is easy. So guide us throughout our lives. Keep us ever mindful of the good news of your forgiving and renewing grace. And all these things we pray in the name of Christ our Lord, as we also together pray the words he taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. It is a good and right and joyful thing always and everywhere to offer ourselves and our gifts to the Lord our God. We do that in this moment, in this time of, of the worship service called the offering. Giving to, to God in Christ through St. Paul United Methodist Church is easy. You may go to the giving link at give.stpaulos.org or giving through the mail at St. Paul, P.O. Box 909, Ocean Springs. May God bless you richly for your continued faithfulness. Let us pray together our offertory prayer. O oh God, bless these gifts that we have given as expressions of our love for you and our neighbors, that they may bring closer to fulfillment your reign of peace and love through Jesus Christ, our Sovereign. Amen. God from the womb of blessings
Today's scripture reading is the Gospel of Luke, chapter 4, verses 21 through 30. After hearing Jesus preach, the congregation at Nazareth at first spoke well of Jesus. But when Jesus reminds them of the mighty works of God performed outside of Israel, the mood darkens and nearly leads to violence. Luke 4, 21 and following. Then he began to say to them, Today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. All spoke well of him and were amazed at the gracious words that came from his mouth. They said, Is this not Joseph's son? He said to them, Doubtless you will quote to me this proverb, Doctor, cure yourself. And you will say, Do hear also in your hometown the things that you have heard, we heard, have heard you did at Capernaum. And he said, Truly I tell you, no prophet is accepted in the prophet's hometown. But the truth is, there were many widows in Israel in the time of Elijah, when the heaven was shut up three years and six months, and there was a severe, severe famine over all the land. Yet Elijah was sent to none of them except to a widow in Serapeth, in Sidon. There were also many lepers in Israel in the time of the prophet Elisha, and none of them was cleansed except Naaman the Syrian. When they heard this, all in the synagogue were filled with rage. They got up, drove him out of the town, and led him to the brow of the hill on which their town was built, so that they might hurl him off the cliff. But he passed through the midst of them and went on his way. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Sometimes a town, through no fault of its own, becomes the butt of everybody's joke. I don't, have you noticed that? W.C. Fields used to quip that he wanted inscribed on his tombstone, all in all, I'd rather be in Philadelphia. Or think of uh, how other cities, towns have been the butt of jokes. Cleveland, Peoria, Brooklyn, they've all come up in their share of quips, whether on the old Tonight Show or wherever. Or can you imagine having to endure the responses when you tell people that you hail from Hell, H-E-L-L, -L, Michigan. Or Bobo, Mississippi. That's right, that's true, look it up. Or Boring, Maryland. Tom Long tells of going to college in a pleasant little village of Dew West, South Carolina. No one is quite sure how the town came by such a name. There are a number of theories, but whenever a local would travel, you know, and say, I come from Dew West... Uh, the inevitable response was, what's it due west of? Actually, the town was due west of nothing. But finally, the good-natured residents simply played along with the joke. They even had bumper stickers printed for local cars reading, due west of what? Every now and then, of course, it's not funny. A town can be ashamed of its own name or embarrassed before the eyes of the world and it will be a long time before the names of Chernobyl or Auschwitz regain their good reputation. Citizens of Waco, Texas, long for the day when their city's name does not conjure up memories of David Koresh and the Branch Davidians. When a man went on trial for the racist bombing some decades, at least four decades or more ago, of the Birmingham church, local residents braced themselves for the rebirth of a slur they had hoped they'd left far behind in the wake of community progress, Bombingham. We're not sure how the little town of Nazareth became ashamed of its name. Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Was evidently a joke of the ancient world. Uh, probably Nazareth was not dismissed because of anything that happened there. Nazareth, as far as we know, produced no other kings, no generals, no scholars, no prophets, no nothing. The actor Robert Mitchum once said of the tough inner city school he had attended, it was actually a finishing school. You go there and you're finished. Well, you come from Nazareth and you're finished. So, so you say you're from Nazareth, ha, huh? anything good ever come out of Nazareth? And the laughter of others burned in their ears. The son of a local workman, Jesus had all the markings of something good finally to come out of Nazareth. He looked like a new prophet. 
smelled like a new prophet. Uh, at least his preaching had bowled over the congregation, congregation after congregation in the synagogues of Galilee before he comes back home here to Nazareth. Uh, because Luke tells us a, a report about him had spread through all the surrounding countries and he was praised by everyone. It was no doubt particularly pleasing for the folks at Nazareth to learn that Jesus had caused such a stir in the rival village of Capernaum. You can almost hear the conversations at the market at Nazareth. High and mighty Capernaum may have looked down on us in the past, but no preacher from Capernaum ever turned the heads like our boy Jesus. So when Jesus came home to Nazareth, the local synagogue was surely packed, and they handed them the Isaiah scroll, and the congregation beamed. He read the words, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. You can see the congregation glowing with pride. He sat down. He began to preach. Today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. And the flock was a buzz. As Luke puts it, all spoke well of him and were amazed at the gracious words that came out of his mouth. Already they were imagining a new sign at the city limits. Welcome to Nazareth, hometown of Jesus. Jesus sensed, however, the hardened muscles around their wounds. Jesus realized that beneath their local pride was a misunderstanding of his calling, a desire to see in him only an expression of Nazareth's vision. You know, they desired, they desired him to be good, to be popular, but they desired him to be theirs alone, to be all Nazareth, and no Capernaum or anybody else, to be for us, but not for them. And Jesus just picked up in the spirit of the crowd there in the synagogue, and he challenged them. He reminded them, no prophet is accepted in the prophet's hometown. Then he, he goes on to give examples. You remember Elijah? Jesus says, of course they do. Elijah was the greatest of the Hebrew prophets, but whom did he feed in the time of the great famine, Jesus asks? Not anyone from Nazareth, or Jerusalem for that matter, or Capernaum. But instead he went to a widow in Sidon, a small town in Lebanon. And Jesus doesn't stop. He says, remember Elijah, he says. Of course they do. Everyone's favorite wonder worker, Elijah. Elisha. But did he heal anyone in the northern kingdom? No. Jesus reminds the congregation that only, the only leper that Elisha heals is Naaman the Syrian. And who was Naaman the Syrian? They probably haven't forgotten. Naaman was also an enemy army commander. That's right. And that hurts. And that is a hard word for Nazareth to hear. What Jesus was saying, in essence, was that in order to be for them, for Nazareth, he was going to have to appear to be against Nazareth because of their mindset. In order to be for Nazareth, Jesus would have to hit the road out of town, a road that would carry him eventually to the hill outside of Jerusalem. And it is a hard lesson for all of us to hear, I believe, about Jesus. Jesus is for us. Yes, thanks be to God, that is the gospel, the good news, but not just for us, but for all others too. In fact, in order to be Savior of all, Jesus will need to turn for the moment against some of us to leave our little hometown images of him mm -hmm, and our desire to shape him in, into our local molds, to leave that behind. In order to be good news for the poor, he will need to speak against those of us who are rich. In order to be a savior for, to the sick and the blind, he will need to leave the safe streets of the healthy. And in order to be a friend of sinners, he will have to speak harshly sometimes to the righteous. Only by going to Jerusalem was he going to save Nazareth. Only this way can he save the poor and the rich, the sick and the well, the righteous and the sinner. And Jesus reminded the synagogue congregation that God's way has always, always been this way. God is creator of heaven and earth. Not some 
local deity that can be enshrined in the grotto down the street. And Jesus reminded the synagogue congregation, that's just the way it's always been. God's saving power is bigger than one town can hold. God's mercy is wider than any one village can imagine. In fact, it was to show his love for Israel that God worked wonders in Sidon and Syria. And I imagine that Jesus telling us that in order to show the love for the church, God is working wonders outside of the church, even outside of Christianity, outside the city limits of every Nazareth we can imagine. The people of Nazareth are enraged by this. Can anything good ever come out of Nazareth? Now they're the ones asking that. And the congregation rode Jesus out of town and even had thoughts of throwing him off the cliff. But Jesus escapes. And Luke provides in that, those last verses about his escape this kind of tantalizing detail. Jesus goes through the middle of them. Some translations are through the midst of them, but through the middle. I think about that detail and all it could mean in the larger sense. Jesus refuses to be caught in that binary trap. It's either this or this. He's not pro-Jew and anti-Samaritan. And he's not pro-Capernaum and anti-Nazareth. And he won't be pinned down as a supporter of any particular political party or any football team. He will not be a Presbyterian or a Catholic or, as much as it pains me to say it, a Methodist. He won't be contained. But here's the thing. Jesus came to be with us whoever we are. Whoever we are. Oh, that is so important. Because at some time or another, we will find ourselves on the wrong side of the dividing line. And that's not a fun place to be. What do I mean by that? I mean that something about ourselves, who we are, whether we can help it or not, will put us on the wrong side of the line where we are looked down on. We're not part of the elect or the select. Our gender, our age, our race, our color, who we love, how much money we make or don't make, our physical abilities or challenges, our nationality, where we went to school, how we pray. These will make us unworthy in the eyes of some. But you know, someone has said, whenever the world draws a line, Jesus steps across to the other side. His love is just that big. And when the congregation rode Jesus out of town and almost threw him off a cliff, that was a foreshadowing, of course, of what the world would eventually do to him on the cross. It's not not God's harshness or aloofness, you see, most of the time, that makes us angry. It's God's mercy. It's too big too wide. It's easier to spend our lives licking our wounds, our local wounds, <laughs> and making nasty remarks about Capernaum or whoever, than it is to try to live as best we can a life of generosity, of kindness, of mercy, as big as Christ's. But you see, the word is that by God's grace, we can try And sometimes we can. And for someone on the other side of the line, that will make all of the difference. All of the difference. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Our closing hymn is the beloved song, Be Thou My Vision. Let us sing together in faith. Thought by day.
heart of my own heart, whatever befall, still be my vision, O ruler of all. Walk in the unfailing strength of God's holy presence this week, and may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of God's holy presence guide you all the way. See you next time. Mm -hmm.